Well, I'll say good morning to everyone. So I just spent the last few days in the great city of Rochester, New York. And it's so nice to come back here and see the sun, because I thought the uh, sun had disappeared entirely. Anyway, I was at the last few days at the OSA meeting, and uh, that's always a lot of fun. Cause I, first off, I see, uh, always see one or two old classmates who I went to school with. Uh, and I see uh, graduates from here from over the years, plus a lot of other friends. So I, uh, I encourage all of you in your career to be active in some of the professional societies, OSA, SPIE, or whatever, and to attend some of these meetings. Because it really, I mean, you learn a little bit, but you have a lot of fun in the process. So it's, uh, it was an enjoyable period of time. So I can almost, I've almost forgotten that it's been so long since I've taught a class here. It's been, what, a week and a half or something. But uh, the last class we were talking about testing of windows and transmission. And I just want to start out by showing this uh, drawing, which uh, we saw last class, because I'm going to use it again today. So again, we were just using, you know, I, I draw this as a Fizeau, laser-based Fizeau, but it could be a uh, Toyman Green or, or whatever. And we put the window in here. We're going to go through the window twice, measure the optical path variations that we experience by going through the window twice. And if we uh, know that the uh, material has uniform index, later we'll worry about what happens if it doesn't. But if we uh, now assume the material has uniform index, but it has some thickness variations, then what we're measuring is n, index of material minus the index outside. So n minus 1 times the thickness variations. And then we go through it twice. So there's a 2 here. Now, we also said last class that sometimes when you're measuring these windows, especially if the two surfaces are, are uh, uh, parallel to each other, you can get problems. You'll get some fringes that you, that you don't want. And so what we said was we could go to a short coherence link source and um, to measure this, this uh, window. And, uh, we still have these reflections we don't want, but they won't be coherent. Um, and so we won't get the fringes, uh, the spurious fringes. So on the left here, we have the case of a long coherence length short source. And then on the right, we have a case of a short coherence length source. And um, it's a little tricky to do a Fizeau type interferometer, especially if you have much separation between the reference and the test and use a short coherence link source. So what we do, what we showed last class, is that we can have a, well, what looks a little bit like an interferometer here, but it's a way of having, taking the one beam, converting it into two beams, where the two beams are delayed relative to one another. And we could use polarization beam splitters here and quarter wave plates, so these two beams have orthogonal polarization. And uh, I described this last class, but both these beams be reflected off here and both beams reflected off here. And if this distance here is set to the path difference for these uh, two arms back here in the source module, then we get interference from the long path length source beam, so this one, reflected off the reference, and the short path length source beam reflected off the test. So were there any questions on that? Understood? Understand how that works? We'll have some other beams present down here, so that will reduce the fringe contrast a little bit, but um, they won't introduce uh, spurious interference fringes. And a good coherence length we found for this source is maybe 200, 300 microns or so. And then we could just, now we could put a window in here. And so we could test that window in transmission. And um, uh, we could also vary delta L. And we could, uh, instead of looking at the light reflected off the return flat, we could look at the light reflected off the first surface or the second surface and uh, look at the fringes produced by, by 
one of these two beams. So it's a, it's a pretty nice way of, of getting around the uh, spurious fringes and again, a repeat of um, the picture we had before of uh, spurious fringes when we get a long coherence link source and then cleaning that up when we use a short coherence link source. Okay, so I want to talk more about looking at windows. And so I'm going to go back and we just say we're going to use this drawing right here. And I'm going to put a window in there and I'm going to measure the wedge in the window. So how does that work? So we're first going to adjust the interferometer so we have a single fringe. And so the beam reflected from the reference and a return flat, uh, two beams will be parallel and we have a single fringe. Then we put the window in the interferometer and if there's any wedge present, so I'm assuming the surface is a flat, but there might be some wedge. And let's say the wedge angle is alpha. And let's say the um, index is again n. And uh, let's just say that the window has a diameter of d. And so that wedge of alpha is going to introduce a, a um, change in the thickness of the plate of the wedge angle times d. So that's alpha d. So that's like our delta t from before. And so the OPD we have will be n minus 1 alpha d. And then we're going to go through the wedge, uh, the wedged window twice. And so we have a, a 2 there. So 2 n minus 1 alpha d is um, the OPD that we would get for going through that window twice where the wedge angle is alpha. Any questions on that? So, in going from one fringe to the next fringe, <clears throat> how much does the OPD change by? What? Well, it's going to change the the OP, total OPD will change by one wavelength and going from one fringe to the next fringe. Okay. Not a half wave, but one wave. Oh, yeah. It, right, if I were to uh, use a short uh, coherence link source, I might have to, yes. But here, let's just say, let's uh, just go back to using a laser source, which is a way of uh, a long coherence link source. And, and so I'm just going to fluff out the fringes, put in the window, and I'll have some OPD. And I know that from one fringe to the next fringe, OPD changes by a wave. And so I can simply put in this equal to a wave and solve for what the distance is between fringes. And so the distance between fringes would be lambda over 2 n minus 1 alpha. So just putting in one wave here and solving for what the distance has to be. Uh, that will give us a separation of the fringes. OK. But I had to fluff out the fringes to begin with, and then I just put this in measure the fringe separation, and then I can solve for what alpha is here. And if I had a Mach Zender interferometer, so what would be the difference? Here? The difference, remember the Mach Zender, we just go through the window once, and so there would, this two would not be present here. Is that clear? You look puzzled, but, okay. Now, another approach here is to, well, maybe I'll put this up here. Just have a beam coming along. And here's my window. And I'll put a lot of wedge in it. And I can just look at the light reflected off the first surface and light reflected off the second surface. 
So I don't need the reference surface in the interferometer. I don't need the return flat. I'm just going to look at my window. And uh, I probably shouldn't put that much wedge in. That's ridiculous. But to measure it this way, the fringes would be so close together. But uh, so I'll just look at the light reflected off of these two surfaces. And um, coming back again. And if we think now, if, uh, if the angle here is alpha, and um, uh, so the thickness variation, if I go across a distance s, would be alpha times s. And uh, inside this material, the index is n. So the OPD would be alpha s times n. And then I'm going here and coming back. So there's a 2, 2 alpha s times n would be the OPD. And when that's equal to a wave, then that will give me the separation of the fringes. So testing and transmission up to the top here. It goes as lambda over 2 n minus 1 alpha. And if I look at it, just look at the light reflected off the two surfaces, then it's going to go as lambda over 2n alpha. Is that clear or is that fuzzy? Well, if I want to know what the, the separation of the fringes is, I'm going to set the OPD equal to one wave. And so that's my, if I'm just looking over some width s, um, if I could just put in what the OPD is. But if I want to know what the fringe spacing is, then I'll just make that one wave. So, you know, index is what? Uh, something like one and a half, typically, anyway. And so this is like um, uh, 0.5. And this is like 1.5. So that's about a difference of 3 in sensitivity here. Whether I'm looking at transmission or looking at it in reflection. I think it's hard to understand why it changed from a way to a whole, whole way of things in equivalent to a, a, the OPD. Uh -huh. Well, maybe when you're saying one fringe corresponds to half a wave, maybe if you're thinking of looking at something at normal incidence, testing a surface at normal incidence, the height changes by half a wave between fringes. But the light's going down and then coming up, and so the OPD is twice that, or one wave. So it's always the optical path between two consecutive interference fringes is always one wave. Now whether that corresponds to a half a wave on the surface or something else uh, depends on the, on the configuration. But whenever you see two fringes, and as long as they're you know, consecutive order numbers, it means that some way the OPD has changed by one wave. I mean, that's a very common, uh, common problem. Is it, half, is it half a wave or is it one wave? Well, for an OPD, it's always a wave. Whether it's a surface or a thickness or something, it depends upon the particular setup you have. But the OPD itself is always one wave. Okay. So I just, uh, the next thing, I just uh, made a little table here of just showing what the um, uh, fringe spacing might be for some wedge angle of alpha here. And I put in N as one and a half, and I used a helium neon laser. So a wavelength of 633 nanometers. And um, the double pass transmission then is that if you have one arc second of wedge, the spacing of the fringes is and. 26 millimeters, and uh, 
Unfortunately, I still think better in inches. I'm sorry to admit that, but I do. So that's what, about five inches. Um, and if I'm doing it in reflection, so I'm looking at the reflection off the two surfaces, now the, the fringe spacing is um, a third of this, or about 42 millimeters. Okay. So, um, I mean, this is a, a pretty good way of measuring window wedge. But to get really accurate results, I mean, I had to, I had to fluff out the fringes exactly. I had to get rid, had to get rid of the fringes uh, before I put the plate in, especially I'm talking about the transmission one here. And um, it's hard to do that exactly. You can get close to it, but it's hard to do it exactly. So a better approach, and if I were to measure window wedge, the approach that I would do would be this. I would set up my, my uh, Fizeau cavity here, and I would put the window in partway, halfway or so. And so I'm going to get a fringe pattern down here from the, in the lower part, and another one up here. And I could, if I want to, adjust this return flat to make this a null fringe or fluff out the fringes down here. And then, you know, the measurement would be the same as what uh, we just did. I'd look at the fringes up here and use the same uh, equations I used before. But I don't really have to fluff out the fringes. What I can do is just, I can compare the fringe pattern up here where the light goes through the window <clears throat> with a fringe pattern down here where there is no window. And I'll get two sets of fringes. Where the, you know, the, the one set here is just due to tip and tilt of this. And the other set is due to tip tilt of this plus whatever wedge I have here. Okay. So when I, <clears throat> when I tip tilt this flat, you know, I, I'm introducing some tilt between the two beams in both parts here, and it should, you know, I'm introducing the same amount of tilt between the two beams when I do this. And the tilt difference then, and I'll define in a minute just what I mean by tilt difference. The tilt difference here will depend upon what the wedge in the window is. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, and I'll define tilt difference in a second, but I'm going to take the tilt here and the tilt here, subtract the two, and divide by 2n minus 1, and I'll get alpha. And if, you know, one of these tilts were zero, if I really truly fluffed out the fringes down here, then I would have the same result that I had previously. So the question might be, what, what in the world do I mean by tilt difference? Well, when I, when I think of tilt, you know, we, we get some interference fringes like, like here. And these fringes have some separation. And the tilt I would define as the wavelength over the separation. Okay. And this is really the same as what we had back here someplace. Um, you know, this S was a separation, and I have, so I'd, I'd have a, a 2n minus 1 alpha is equal to lambda over S. So that's equal to tilt times lambda over S. Okay, so that, that's my definition of tilt. Um, and I could say, well, you know, they, these fringes, they have a spacing of D. If I were to measure in the X direction, they have some spacing of D sub X. And I could, if, you know, these fringes are going at some angle theta relative to the X axis. And so D sub X is simply, well, D over sine alpha and d sub y here is just d over cosine alpha. So I could say, you know, if beta is my tilt, lambda over d, beta in the x direction, the tilt in the x direction is lambda over d sub x, and the tilt in the y direction is lambda over d sub y. So now I'm going to go to my two interferograms here, and I'm going to calculate the tilt for the top one and the tilt for the bottom one. 
So I have a, you know, I don't know, I don't know what direction the fringes are going to be in. So I will have a tilt in the x direction and I have a tilt in the y direction up here. And down here, I will also have a tilt in the x direction and a tilt in the y direction. And this tilt difference then is just the square root of the sum of the squares of the differences in the tilt in the x direction and the tilt in the y direction. So my computer is going to calculate this tilt difference here, I'm going to plug it back into my expression right here, and I input whatever the index is, and uh, I end up with my wedge angle. And so it doesn't matter just how I, the orientation of the plate that I put in there, and it doesn't mean that I have to really fluff out the fringes. I just, you know, set this up any way I want, stick in a window part way, and measure the tilt up here and the tilt down there, subtract the two, and I can solve for the, the wedge in the window. And so this is the, um, the most, probably the most common way of measuring window wedge. And it's good for, I mean, you can measure sub arc seconds of, of window wedge. Um, or you can go up to, to many arc seconds. If you have too much window wedge, then this probably is not a good way of measuring it because the fringes would get too close together. Yes? How do you measure compared to the Uh, well, I think we're going to look at that in, in a second here. I would say, well, I, of course, I like interferometers, so it's, interferometer is always the best way. You know. But um, um, the auto, well, we'll talk about autocollimeter in a minute but here, but uh, I think if you really are measuring real small wedge, this is probably a better way of doing it. If you're measuring something with a, a few minutes of wedge, forget it, this isn't going to do it. The fringes are going to be too close together. Sub-arc seconds, or a few arc seconds, this is the best way. Okay, any questions? Well, since you just happened to mention autocollimeter, we'll, <laughs> we'll say a couple of words about it. So, um, well, I'll, I'll come back to this slide, but we all saw the autocollimator before, and we know that we're taking a beam of light and we're collimating it, and in some way we're sending the light back into the autocollimator, and we're looking at the position of the focus spot here. And if I put a window wedge, or put a window here with a little wedge in it, I'm going to get two reflected beams back, and so I'm going to get two spots here. And so I can measure the distance between the two spots, and that will give me the difference in the angles between the two reflected beams. And that gives me then the window wedge. And um, so um, I, I think I, I don't know that I say anything here I didn't say before. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, if you tip and tilt the whole wedge, I mean the two spots will move around, but the important thing is the distance between the two spots um, will um, remain the same. And you can get down here to an arc second, and, and you, can, you can actually do a little bit better than an arc second, but I, as I said before, I'd probably use a, an interferometer if I were going to get down much below an arc second. The um, Remember that if alpha is the wedge angle, and now I'm, I'm reflecting off of this surface and this surface, and so I have a, a 2n alpha is going to be my uh, angular separation between the two beams. Generally, the autocollimator will take into account the factor of 2, but then you'll have to take account the factor of n by, your, by yourself here. Okay. Any questions on that? So have you used an autocollimator to test wedge in any of these in lab? Yeah, good. Have you used an interferometer to test wedge? 
Oh no, terrible. Okay. Well, most interferometers you buy nowadays, they'll have a part of the software. Well, you just tell it you're measuring a window wedge and it will take into account the refractive index and the factors of two and so on and give you directly what the, what the wedge is. Well, um, let's talk just a little bit about prism testing. I guess, you know, a window with some wedge in it is, is a prism of sort, but pretty small angle maybe. But let's talk a little bit about the, the testing of prisms in, in general. And um, we'll talk about interferometers, goniometers, autocollimators, and then I always like some of these naked eye tests. So what, what might we measure about a prism? Well, we might measure the accuracy of each face, each surface. And so we simply would, would be thinking of that as a, um, uh, as a mirror. You know, you can test each, each surface of a, of a prism just as a mirror. You may want to measure the accuracy of the angles. We'll talk about that in particular for uh, 90 degree angles. Maybe you want to measure the index variations in the, in the sample. Or maybe you want to measure just the transmitted wavefront accuracy. That's maybe the most common thing that you might measure. And so let's first just looking at measuring the, the wavefront accuracy. And so it goes back to testing a prism in transmission. I mean, it's just like, just like testing a window in transmission, except the, um, because of the prism angle here, the beam is refracted. And so I just have to rotate my return flap so the beam is normal to it. And so I would just go through the prism twice. And just like testing the window in transmission, I mean, again, we're measuring, well, we want some thickness variations because of the prism angle, but this is measuring how the thickness variations differ from just the fact that it's a prism. And so it's just like testing a a window before we have a, you know, n minus one delta t, and we multiply that by two because we go through it twice, and so that's the OPD, and um, um, that then would give us what errors we have in the thickness of the prism. So the only thing was to rotate, rotate the return flat so the beam is is normal to it. So the next thing we might want to do is to measure the angle of a prism. And in particular, what we often get involved with is 90 degree prisms. And so I want to determine how close is this angle here to 90 degrees. And if I think for a second here, if, if I turn you know, I, I send a beam of light in here, and it strikes here, and let's say this is at 45 degrees. So this then would go up at 90 degrees, and then if this is truly a 90 degree prism, then this would be at 45 degrees to that, and it would come back here. So the return beam would come back in exactly the opposite direction that the beam went in here. And even if I take this prism and wiggle it around in the, in the plane of the screen, if this, if this is truly a 90 degree prism here, this beam will always go back in exactly opposite direction. It turns it around by twice this angle, so it turns it around by 180 degrees. Okay, so that, that's great if that's a 90 degree prism, but let's say it's not quite 90 degrees. Let's say this is off by some amount epsilon. Okay? A couple arc seconds maybe. And let's say for right now, let's say it's too large. It's 90 degrees plus epsilon. So this beam goes in here, reflects off there, 
and comes off here at some angle. So if this angle is too large by epsilon, inside the glass here, this beam coming back will not come right back in the opposite direction that it went in, but it's going to be off by what angle inside the glass? If this is off by epsilon. Two epsilon, right. So inside the glass, this is going to be off by two epsilon. Then outside the glass, it's going to be off by, well, we go back to Snell's law, and it's off by 2n times epsilon. So this angle out here is 2n epsilon. And if I, some way, if I could measure this angle, then I could solve for epsilon. Okay. And we'll, some way, we'll figure out how to do that in a minute. Well, that was true for a beam. Well, let's say, uh, let's say this is too small by an angle epsilon. Well, now what this still would be off by 2n epsilon, but if this angle were too small, what the beam would be coming down here instead of going up. Okay? So too small an angle, beam come down. Too large an angle, beam goes up. Okay, now for the little more tricky question. That was light going in here and reflecting off the bottom surface and then the top surface. What if light goes in here and reflects off the top surface and then the bottom surface? Well, if this is 90 degrees, this is still going to come back in exactly the opposite direction. <clears throat> but if this angle is too large by epsilon, this beam that goes in here, comes here, and comes back here, what how does this beam come out down here? Off by an angle of 2n epsilon. Now the tricky thing here, maybe we have to vote on this, getting close to the election day here. Does it come down by 2n epsilon or does it go up by 2n epsilon? Down? Okay. How many say down? How many say up? How many don't say? <laughs> oh, boy, I don't know. Is it up or is it down here? Well, I mean, if I think of this coming down here, if this angle is too large, then um, what's reflected off here would come, oops, lost my pointer, would come a little bit too much this way. So it's coming in like this. Ah, so it is going to be down. You believe that? Or I, I could have thought of this, you know, I, I, I thinking of the angle error being there. I can think of the angle error being there and the beam comes in and this angle is too large and so it's going to come down. So if they, if this 90 degree angle is too large, the two beams are going to leave sort of diverging, well, going away from each other. Maybe I shouldn't say diverging, but going away from each other. And if the two angle, if the 90 degree angle is too small, the two beams will go towards one another. Too large apart, too small towards. Okay. So, what I can do here is I can go to my Fizeau again. And I'll put in my 90 degree prism. And the beam will come down here, you know, and some will strike the first part, come down here and come out here, and some will strike down here and here and here. And if this is a perfect 90 degree angle, then the, you know, the beam will go back. It'll be a nice collimated beam. And uh, it's going to go back in exactly the opposite direction. And so at least in the, the, the plane of the screen, I will not have any tilt. Oops. Here. Coming out of the screen, you know, I can mess around with the prism and get some tilt. Now I could introduce some tilt here 
by rotating this reference surface. So I can introduce tilt fringes if I want. But the fringes will be uniform across the whole thing. But if this angle is wrong, either too large or too small, you know, I, I, I could adjust this. So, you know, I have these two beams coming out at some angle, and I could adjust the reference here to be right in between, and I could get the same number of fringes in both halves. But if I tip and tilt this a little bit, I will probably increase the number of fringes on one side and decrease the other fringes on the other side. And so I might get a pattern that looks like this. Okay. And <clears throat> just like we, we did before, I could find the angle here. Um, just the tilt difference between these two, calculating tilt difference just like we did before, divide by 4n, and that will give me the error in the prism angle. Okay. So if I change the tilt of the reference, what's going to happen here? You know, if, so I have these two beams coming out. I think I'm going them like so. And if my reference is tilted in between the two, then as I change my reference angle, I'm going to increase the number of fringes in one and decrease the other the fringes in the other one. Well, maybe I should skip put on here. Let's say that So this represents the two beams from the prism or from the 90 degree angles. And let's say this is my reference. And so I can tip and tilt my reference here to change this angle around. And so I could, as I move this over here, I'm going to get fewer fringes on one side and more on the other. And if I go the opposite way, then I'll get fewer over here than over there. And if I move it so that if I adjust the tilt to be way outside here, well, you know, as I increase it, or as I change the angle, I'm going to change the number of fringes in both of these. But one is going to have a lot more fringes in it than the other one. And so when I do the tilt difference here, I'm subtracting out the effect or the, the tilt angle of the reference because that's the same for both of these. And I'm getting just the, the angle between the two and that will give me the prism error or 90 degree angle error. Okay. Do you follow or not? <clears throat> well, any questions? Okay, you look puzzled. I don't know. Maybe because it's 8.40 in the morning. I don't know. Oh, yeah, that's a nasty thing. The front surface of the prism. I don't like that. So what I, how would you get rid of the, yeah. you would just tilt it a little bit. But that's a good point. I mean, these stray reflections, they just drive you crazy in these interferometers. So you just, you just tilt it a little bit and get rid of the reflection off the front surface. So if you have a big error, do you actually get kind of a, a solid with no information in the interferometer in the middle? Or oh, yeah. Well, you're worried about the, the beams separating so much in space. Yeah, I'm interested yeah. in how two distinct zones. Yeah, I mean, uh, I certainly have seen that. Um, what I might do is to put in a um, imaging lens, and you can bring everything back together again. If I image, you know, image say the front surface here, then you, you bring it back together. But if you have that much angle error, probably the interferometer is not the thing to use. We may have to go to the autocollimator, which we'll worry about in a minute. Here. Okay. But I want to make sure you understand how this works. 
I mean, this is, is, is often used to measure prism angles, but there's something wrong with it. There's a couple things wrong with it. Uh, but I want to make sure you understand it before we talk about the things that are wrong with it. So I'll ask you, what, what might be wrong with this using this technique? People use it, but there's something wrong. Two things wrong. <coughs> well, the first thing, I'm getting 4% eh, reflectivity from here, typically. And I'm getting almost 100% from here. And so the fringe contrast is not going to be great. I could put an attenuator in here and get around that problem. But um, that's one, I'll say, minor problem. The bigger problem is this last line down here. You know, these, if you just go out and buy a normal Fizeau-type interferometer, this collimated beam is not very good. Because we, before, when we were talking about using a Fizeau, we said, oh, you know, all this other optics here, they don't, you know, doesn't have to be high quality. It's only this last surface that has to be high quality. Well, the problem here is that this beam goes in here, goes in the top, comes out the bottom. And what comes out the bottom comes out the top. But for the reference, you know, what's up top stays up top, what's at the bottom stays at the bottom. So the beam, one beam is kind of flipped over relative to the other beam. And so errors in this collimated beam do not cancel out. Now, you could make a Fizeau interferometer that had a high-quality collimated beam. Um, but if you just go out and buy one from any of the companies that sell these, you'll find out this collimated beam is not very good. And so you're going to, this measurement here is not going to be very accurate. I still see people using this, but it's, it's not very accurate. So this is what we call a single pass. You know, the light just went in here and came back. A way to get around the problem with this collimated beam and to get around the intensity problem is the following. <clears throat> Same setup as before, except I'm going to block half the beam here. So now the beam goes in here, reflects back here. This beam goes down here, reflects down here, reflects here, oh, and then reflects off that, back here, here, and here. So at least one thing is good. I got, you know, maybe a 4% reflectivity here. I go in here and I get almost 100%, and then I get another 4%. So the intensities of the two beams are pretty close to the same. So the fringe contrast is going to be better. And, I mean, the beam is no longer flipped over, so that's good. The only question might be, <clears throat> do my errors in this 90-degree prism cancel or, or do they add? So let's think here for a second. Let's say this angle is too large. And... Um, Um, so the beam goes here, here, and it comes out too low, and um, reflects off here, so it's going back in this direction. So when it comes up here, it's going to go back here. So the errors are not going to cancel. In fact, they're going to double when I go through here. Now the question might be, if I tip and tilt this reference surface, what does that do to the two beams? Well, let's say I tilt it in the clockwise direction. And so this beam will come in, and this beam will be reflected up here. Okay. Now, this beam, it goes through here and is reflected off there, and this whole thing is, remember, tilted in the clockwise direction. So the beam, it goes here, here, and comes back there. Does that go this way, or does that go this way? I'll drink some coffee while you think about that. In fact, I could probably drink a couple of cups while you think about that.
It goes the same way. Yeah, it does. It actually does. That's nice. So let's think. So I'm rotating this clockwise. So this goes here, here. This is rotated clockwise. So this is going to be reflected back this way. But remember the 90 degree prism. I mean, we could go through and look at each of these reflections. But remember the thing about this prism, you send it in here and it always comes back in exactly the opposite direction. So if you rotate this clockwise, this beam comes down here. When it strikes here, then it's going to end up going back here. Same direction as the reference. So at least in the plane of the screen, it's not true outside of the plane of the screen, but in the plane of the screen, tipping and tilting this does the same to both the reference beam and the test beam. Now that's always a little tricky. I mean, even though we went through it here, I think you, you want to go back to your seat today and desk and make sure I'm not lying about this. That, it, that the tip in the plane of the screen, tipping and tilting of this does the same to the reference and to the test. And so if we call this tilt in the y direction here, so we get an interferogram that looks like this. We don't get the two halves, we only get half, you know, half what we had before. We get an interferogram here. And any wedge, or excuse me, any error in this 90 degree angle will give us tilt in this direction. And so it turns out the prism error angle, if you go through it, and I'm hoping you do, oops, take the tilt in this direction, tilt as we've defined before, and this double pass here, so it's a 4n here, that will give us the error in this prism angle. Intensities are almost matched. The beam is no longer flipped over. And, you know, errors in the collimated beam cancel. Well, if you have huge errors, they, they don't quite cancel, but normal, the normal errors you'll have will cancel. So this works very well for testing 90 degree prisms. There's only one thing you have to watch out for if you're building an interferometer or buying an interferometer, make sure you can put in a beam block here. Because there have been commercial interferometers on the market, which was pointed out to me once by someone when I was teaching a short course, that, but there have been interferometers sold where you can't stick in a card here to block half the beam. And you have to be able, so before this transmission flat, you want to be able to block half the beam. Okay. Any questions on this? So we'll just, I mean, we're doing this double pass. So we just call this a double pass system. Okay, I mean, another way is to use a goniometer, autocollimator, and um, so we just go to the drawing, I guess, here. So you would just uh, set this up. Typically, you're just going to use an autocollimator here, and you would uh, put the prism on the table here, and you would retroreflect off of a, surf off of a, a surface, and then move us around here, re retroreflect off a second surface, and of course by how far you turn this, you can read off a scale how far you had to move it, and so you can get the, the um, prism angle that way. Okay. And this is not, of course, not just for 90 degrees, this is whatever angle. So this is a, you know, certainly a very good way of doing it. There's another error in the, um, in the uh, prism that uh, maybe not quite as common as uh, measuring the errors in the angle, but maybe these surfaces here are not, uh, or lines here if you want, are not parallel to one another. And so you have an error in the pyramid. And so these would intersect up here. <coughs> so we have this and so we can use a goniometer to measure what this error is too. 
And so let's say, you know, this is one side we say is AB, and then we have an AC, and we have a BC here. And the error in that prism angle is this angle AOP here. So we could measure that by adjusting the, the uh, telescope <coughs> axis so it's perpendicular to face AB so over here. And then we adjust it so it's <coughs> perpendicular to AC. That's AC here. And then we go and look at side BC. And if there's a displacement in the back reflected angle, then the uh, image is displaced an amount that would be twice the AOP uh, angle error here. So you could measure, use a goniometer, autocollimator, to measure error in the pyramid. Um, autocollimator is very good for measuring error in the 90 degree prism as well. Instead of using the interferometer, you can use the autocollimator. So here's our 90 degree prism. And we'll set up autocollimator here, looking in. And if there's no error in this 90 degree angle, we're just going to get one spot coming back. One, one beam coming back and get one spot at the focus here. If there's an error in this 90 degree angle, then these beams come back by, what, 2n alpha, 2n alpha in opposite directions. And so there's an angle between these two beams of 4n alpha, 4n alpha, where I'm using alpha now as my error in the 90 degree prism instead of uh, epsilon. I guess. And so I simply, uh, measure that using the autocollimator, measure the 4n alpha, take into account what n is, and I know I can determine what the error in the 90 degree prism is. Well, at least I can determine the magnitude of the error. Just looking at this, I can't tell if these two beams were going away from each other or going towards each other. I just know that there's an angle between them. And so I can get the magnitude of the error in this 90 degree angle. But I can't get the sign. I don't know if, they, if it's too large or you know, if it's greater than 90 degrees or less than 90 degrees. And so what we do for that then is we take this 90 degree prism and we put it on a flat here. And instead of measuring the angle inside, we're going to measure the angle outside. And we should get the same result as here, except there's no n here, and there was an n here, so we we get the 4 alpha here. And now what we do, we simply tilt this prism a little bit to see, do the spots move closer together or further apart? And so that will tell us, as we tilt this, whether the, the spots move closer together, further apart, will tell us whether this angle is greater than 90 or less than 90. And then we know that you know, if this is greater than 90, we know this one must be less than 90 and vice versa. So we have to do, we do, typically we do two measurements. And maybe you could just do the one here, but typically people will do two. And uh, you can get the magnitude of the error, and then you can also get the sign, whether it's too large or too small. Uh-huh. With the close measurement, see if you move the prism actually a little bit, then you can tell if these two spots are coming closer or separate apart. And from that, can you tell with the, the, if bigger than the 90 or No, if I move the prism here, talking about the one on the left side, it's not going to change at all. It's not going to change. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't change. Um, but out here, if you tilt it, tip it a little bit, it will change. So that will tell you if the angle.
was too large or too small. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't see how that. Uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't. I don't. Maybe it will give you. You can think more about it. I don't. But I don't see how it, how that would give you whether it's too large or too small. I don't know. Think about it. If you have, think about it more and convince yourself it's right, then come talk to me. And see if you can convince me. Okay. Any questions on this? So we've measured the 90 degree angle, uh, and we know what the error is in that. Now we have these other two angles that are supposed to be. 45 degrees, but um, what are they really? Yeah. So a way of, of doing that is to set this up, either putting it on a mirror, or generally you see little, little ball bearings here that maybe you set it on. And you retroreflect off of the surface. Now, problem is that I'm going to get a reflection off this surface, plus I'm going to get the reflections inside here coming back and driving me crazy. So you generally you put something on these surfaces to cut down on reflections. And I think I got this out of Johnson's uh, little book that we talked about before. And he recommends putting Vaseline on these surfaces to cut down on these reflections. And so you're going to see only the surface from, from here. Well, what, what I found that works very well for cutting down the reflections here is to buy a, a Hershey chocolate bar. And you take some of the chocolate and you rub that on the two surfaces. And that cuts down the reflection. And that's my favorite technique because it doesn't take too much of the chocolate to do that. And so you have a lot of chocolate left uh, over. So I like that better than Vaseline, but you can use whichever you, whichever you prefer. So the idea here is that we will first put one surface down here. And let's say we put the AC side down here. And we set up our autocollimator to retroreflect off the hypotenuse. And then we put the BC side down here. And now, unless angle A and angle B are the same, now these two beams are I mean, it's not going to be retroreflecting anymore. And so we'll measure an angle here. That, let's say that's 2 alpha. And that 2 alpha is twice the difference between A and B. So I'll first put, you know, AC down here. So that's angle A, retroreflect. Change the prism to put BC down here. You're no longer retroreflected. You measure an angle 2 alpha. And that's twice the difference between angle A and angle B. And by observing the direction in which the image has moved, you can determine which angle is larger. And um, you already know the 90 degree angle from the previous measurement. And so now you can determine the true value of the two 45 degree angles. So now by this and this, you've measured all three of these angles. Okay. Okay. Good. Now we go to a, um, a sixty degree prism. So we have these three angles, A, B, and C. And they're all supposed to be 60 degrees. Well, they're not, probably. I mean, we know that A plus B plus C has to be 180 degrees. And so what we do is that we would um, maybe put one of, the, one of the 
angles down here, let's say A, and set this up to retroreflect off of this. And then we'll rotate the prism to put B down here and C down here. And let's say, you know, so retroreflect off A, put C there, we measure some angle, you know, it's no longer retroreflected, so we know that 2 A minus C is some angle alpha. And we know that 2, and if we put B down there and we measure, you know, again, it's not retroreflected off by some beta. Now we know 2 A minus B is beta. And so we have, you know, three equations here. A plus B plus C is 180. We know alpha, we know beta. We have 2A minus C is alpha, 2A minus B is beta. And so we can just play with the algebra here a little bit. Solve for C, solve for B in terms of both these in terms of A. Plug that back into this expression here. And we end up with this result. And now we can solve for angle A. And once we get A, we can solve for C and we can solve for B. And so we can measure all three all three uh, angles here. Okay. Naked eye tests. This is, uh, again, going back to this little book by Johnson that we mentioned a few days ago. This is, um, is from when the prism is quite a ways from being 90 degrees, a few minutes of arc. What you can do here, this actually works pretty well. Um, and um, you can look in here at this prism, and you can see the pupil of your eye. And if this is truly a 90 degree prism, you know, the shape of your eye is going to be round, round pupil. If this angle is too small, the beams coming back here will be reflected towards one another, and your pupil is going to be elongated in the horizontal direction. Here. While if this angle is too large, you look in here and your pupil is going to be come squished together in the horizontal direction. And so you, you simply look at the image of your iris of your eye, and you get an idea as to whether the angle here is 90 or too large or too small. I mean, it's not, you're not going to measure arc seconds here, but you'll measure a few minutes of, of arc. And I remember a, a few years ago I was teaching this. I had a student who really, I don't know, for some reason he loved this test. I don't know. I have to admit I'm not that excited about it myself. But he was so excited about it. He was putting round, instead of using the pupil of his eye, he was putting a card with a, circular hole in it in front of his eye and he was looking at the shape of that card and he went through quite a little study to see just how accurate he could uh, he could measure angles here so it's uh, I mean if you're just going in the lab and you want to pick out the best 90 degree prism you have and you have several and this is probably a good way to, to do it but it's not a it's not a real accurate technique Another test of, uh, of the 45 degree angles here is the following, another naked eye test. So you're looking at some target at a distance here. And you're looking at light reflected off the top of the hypotenuse and light that goes into the prism being refracted, reflected off the hypotenuse and then refracted again and coming back here. And if these angles are really both, night, uh, both 45 degrees, uh, the image you get off the top and the image you get for the light going through the prism um, will agree, and you'll look at this target and it's going to be lined up nicely. If the angles are not 45 degrees, then you're going to see a little vertical displacement between the two images of this target, image off the top and image going through. If you have an error in the pyramid angle, you're going to see, you know, that the two things will be translated 
two portions of the target would be translated sideways, a small amount. Again, this is not a real um, highly accurate test, but it, it's a few minutes of arc. And uh, so again, if you're just going through your collection of prisms and trying to pick out the best ones, this is probably not a bad way of doing it. Okay. So again, more details on this are back in, in Johnson's uh, um, book. Testing corner cubes. I love corner cubes. I don't know. Everyone here knows what a corner cube is? Have you all seen a corner cube? So if you look in a corner cube, what do you see? Yeah, you see your eye. See your right eye or do you see your left eye? Well, it depends. Uh, I mean, you see your, your eye right in the middle and you tip and tilt this and stuff and you always see your eye. You can't, can't get rid of your eye. And if you have both eyes open, the one, the one you're going to see would be your dominant eye. So for me, I'd see my right eye. Most of you see your right, but a few of you probably see your left eye. But I mean, this is it's such a, you know, it's kind of simple device. It's just three mirrors at 90 degrees, like the corner of the room here. But it, it's so cool. You, you send a beam of light into this, and the beam will come back in exactly the opposite direction. I mean, before we had a 90 degree prism in one plane it came back in the opposite direction. But now it just, you know, comes back in exactly the right uh, opposite direction. Uh, and as I tip and tilt the corner cube or whatever, it, it still comes back in uh, exactly the opposite direction. Kind of cool. And um, so I could test this corner cube by putting it in my physiology, you know, sort of like what we did with a 90 degree prism. We're going to put this in here and we're going to get a beam reflected off our reference and we're going to get beam reflected off our corner cube. And we're going to get some interferogram out here. Now, if this corner cube is perfect, you know, the beam coming back here is going to be nicely collimated. And even as I tip and tilt this corner cube, the beam coming back is still going to be nicely collimated. And I'm going to get, you know, straight fringes. And I can change the number of fringes by tipping and tilting the reference surface here. If these angles are not 90 degrees, though, I'm going to get a different pattern back here. And if I think for a second, how many separate interferograms will I get when a light comes back? You want to guess, or maybe you've looked in your notes, I don't know. Well, you might think three, but you're only half right. So <laughs> it's going to be six, because you think, you know, the corner cube has three mirrors, so I could reflect off mirror one, then two, and then three, or the light could reflect off one, three, and two, you know, two, one, three, two, three, one, and so on. There are six combinations of how the light could reflect off the three mirrors. And so I get six interferograms. And, you know, as I said, if this corner cube is perfect, these will be straight, equally spaced fringes. And I can change the number of fringes by, by um, uh, tilting the reference. But if these angles are off, if they're not 90 degrees, then I will get six separate interferograms. And the, the shape of this would change as if I change the angle of the, of the reference mirror. I, I've set this up so the angle of the reference mirror you know, reflects the light right back on itself. And you can maybe see these little lines in here. You know, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, if the... I mean, you almost never see exactly something like this because if if the surfaces of the corner cube are not really flat then well these fringes would not be straight and then these fringes wouldn't be as straight here either but i'm just i'm assuming that the surfaces are flat so i have a unique angle between different surfaces 
and I'll get these six interferograms. And you can go through here. Uh, I'm not going to derive this. I'll give you a reference in a second. Um, and you can find that if I take the tilt difference between any two interferograms, that gives me one of the 90 degree angle errors. And if n is the refractive index of the corner cube, and I take the tilt difference here, I calculate tilt difference just like we did before, then the error turns out to be the tilt difference divided by 3.266n. And I'd have to say that, uh, uh, I mean, this 3.266 has some square roots and stuff in it to get that strange number. And the derivation of this is, is somewhat complicated. And so um, my way of solving that was to get a uh, graduate student uh, whose last name was Thomas. And uh, Dave Thomas was his name. And uh, he derived this for us. And we published it back in Joseph back a long time ago, 1977. Um, and if you really want to know how to derive this, I'll let you go back and look at that paper. It, it's fairly, well, I won't say it's difficult, but it, it takes a little while to, to go through that derivation. But that's a, you know, it works out pretty well for measuring these angle errors. And um, um, you know, the problem here is just like when we did the 90 degree angle. We have two problems. We get you know, almost 100% of light coming back from the corner cube. We get 4% from here, roughly. And so the fringe contrast is not great unless we put some attenuator in here. But the real problem is that the beam here, you know, is flipped over in kind of a strange way. And errors in this collimated beam just do not cancel. And just like for the 90 degree prism, if you try to use a commercial Fizeau interferometer, um, you're not going to get very accurate results. And so what would you make a wild guess as to how we get around this problem? Yeah, we're going to do a double pass test here where we're going to put in a, we're going to block off half and uh, going to do a double pass. So I think my time is about up today, so I won't go through that, but we'll, we'll come back and... Um, I mean, this, has, uh, this setup here has uh, a, a unique challenge that uh, phase shifting came along and saved. But uh, we'll talk about that uh, bright and early next Tuesday morning. So any questions before we... Uh, yes? I have a question about the Hershey chocolate. Should I yes. use dark one or chocolate? Well, I like the milk chocolate myself. You know. So, uh, but maybe you should try both. And, uh, See which one works better and report back next class. Okay, so uh, 